Does the public have accurate information on the dangers of chemicals, pesticides, toxic chemicals, and wireless radiation? Why or why not? Well, my experience is no, because even as a seasoned physician, maybe even 10 years ago, um, who had gone through med school, gone through residency, had been a clinical doctor for at least about seven to 10 years, um, I didn't even know that there's such poor regulation in the U.S. consumer market, that chem chemicals are not required to be tested before they go to the market, and we love our stuff. So unfortunately, I think people don't realize that the stuff they love potentially could cause them health issues. And, uh, you know, and I'm a big proponent of getting that information out there and teaching people about the regulatory downfalls and pitfalls and, and lack thereof, and also to teach them how to make better choices, knowing uh, which chemicals potentially could cause harm in which products. You said we have had 90,000 chemicals added to our world over the last 200 years. Should we be concerned about this? Are they affecting our health or disease? Is there any proof that these 90,000 chemicals create disease? How are our kids affected by this? Yeah, so this is a wonderful question. So I think people first have to understand that there are that many chemicals that are now allowable in our products. That's the first thing. Since the 1950s, these numbers have exploded. And again, because our legislation and our regulations are so limited, they don't require manufacturers in the US to test these chemicals for safety, toxicity, and especially in very vulnerable populations such as pregnant women, children, and those with autoimmune diseases. And so the issue really becomes, once we know that, how can this really, in a big picture, how can this be good for us from an anthropology perspective? Anthropology has shaped almost everything I do in medicine. I don't think we just plunked right down here and started living with nice cologne and fancy shoes. We've evolved millions of years to manage a lot of our outside exposures. But when we get to 100 years of 90,000 chemicals in food, in water, in air quality, in feminine care products, um, and lay on even additionally uh, radiation exposure, stress, uh, poor sleep. Um, you know, when we start to layer on these exposures, what I call environmental health, you can see that the human body is actually not genetically or environment or evolutionarily prepared for all of this so close in, in history. And so I do want people to step back, think about this. Now, individually, these chemicals do in fact are, you know, cause health issues. Um, I would say cause, but also associated more likely because we have confounders. Um, and there's no question there's over 800 to 1,000 known endocrine disrupting chemicals, EDCs as they're called, that actually disrupt the normal functioning of hormones in the human body. These have been touted, studied, um, and written about, published internationally, World Health Organization, American Academy of Pediatrics, Endocrine Society. Um, and so we do know that there are in fact health uh, connections, associations to exposures, um, and that has been well vetted um, and robust in the literature. Um, we can go into specifics as we go through the, the, this interview, but I do want people to know that we do have third party testing, university level, international study, uh, testing from uh, uh, NGOs and, and, and not manufacturing to definitely show that there are associations between our um, environmental chemicals, many of them, many, many of them, and human health issues. Why do we need to talk about chemicals, toxins, or dangerous substances in our food, air, water, and soil? Aren't there government agencies making sure that everything is safe and healthy for me? Well, we have government agencies that uh, back in the 19, well, 1938, the safe, uh, the um, uh, Federal Drug and Cosmetic Act, um, also the FDA and the EPA that do a certain degree of oversight, do have some oversight. But the problem is that there are too many chemicals and not enough of the actual required testing. Um, we've opened the, the floodgates to manufacturing and free trade and proprietary secrets of, of fragrance. The word fragrance can have up to 300 um, or more chemicals that are not um, required to be disclosed or transparent to the consumer. Um, and we've really based most of our regulatory um, uh, we really don't have very much regulation anymore, even on food chemicals. Um, you know, we really let the manufacturers run wild. Um, and that's because of their kind of, you know, they've got their claws on, um, you know, between lobbyists and, you know, the heavy cost of the food industry. 
um, they're, they're not required to actually, you know, um, uh, monitor themselves similar to, or I should say in similar to Europe, where they have much more um, rigorous vetting for the chemicals that go into their food um, and their cosmetics. And in fact, we have companies that actually create different um, recipes or re different manufacturing components for shampoo or conditioner or different um, cosmetics, cleaning products that we allow, but Europe does not. Same company. So, you know, it's been a letdown. You know, we've had some regulatory oversight back in the 1950s and 1938 actually is when it began in the 1950s. But since that time, food is now considered generally regarded as safe as the most stringent form of oversight, which is really saying, okay, manufacturers, tell us what you think if it's safe. So clearly they're biased in, in their design to, to get these chemicals into their products. So the answer is Tosca, uh, which is another regulatory bill that was supposed to go through when Lautenberg was still alive, um, that fell, fell flat. And now we are really just without great legislation to manufacture, to, to require these, um, this kind of testing. 